Well, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, talking about Moravian Decorative Arts is one of my favorite things to do, so I'll try not to take too much of your time. Um, <clears throat> I will, I'm going to start with a little bit of background, and I know that that is definitely um, preaching to the choir as far as this group is concerned. So the Moravians who founded the communities in the American colonies, as you know, trace their history to the Bohemian martyr John Huss, who burned at the stake in the 15th century for his opposition to the corruptions of the Catholic Church. The death of Huss set off a series of religious wars that disrupted Middle Europe for decades and sent the Hussites into hiding. I always like to start with a little martyrdom. Fire on the screen gets everybody excited. Despite persecution lasting for centuries, a small group of Hussites persevered in their beliefs and eventually found refuge on the Saxon estate of Ludwig von Zinzendorf. <clears throat> Here, uh, in 1722. Here, under the influence of Zinzendorf's pietist teachings, these Protestants founded a religious community called Herrenhut and watched over the rebirth of the unity of the brethren, or as we refer to it today, the Moravian Church. It was in Herrenhut that the Moravians developed many of the unique practices and customs that they brought with them when they migrated to America. The Moravians' 18th century spiritual beliefs were grounded in the principles of pietism, sprinkled with a healthy dose of German mysticism, and the church maintained tight control over the material and spiritual affairs of the community. Theirs was a Christocentric movement. <clears throat> Devotion to Christ was so central, in fact, that misinformed critics complained that the Moravians did a disservice to the Holy Trinity. Um, others in the largely Protestant American colonies complained that Moravian iconography was too clo closely aligned with that of Roman Catholicism, casting a cloud of suspicion over the early years of the movement in America. John Valentine Height, a Moravian who moved from Herrenhut to the first successful Moravian community in America, Bethlehem, in 1754, became one of only a few early American religious painters. While his portraits of serene believers pepper early Moravian collections, it was his graphic portrayals of the punishment and death of Christ that were used to remind those believers of the sacrifice made for them. The importance of the Christian conviction of these people cannot be overemphasized when considering many of the decorative arts. Shortly after the founding of Herrenhut, the unity began sending colonists to America. The first American settlement, founded in 1735 in Georgia, failed. But the second, founded in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, in the early 1740s, did quite well as a communal society managed by the church. At about the same time that the Moravians were looking to expand their horizons in America, the Earl of Granville, and a proprietor of the Royal Province of North Carolina, was looking for industrious colonists. He encouraged the Moravians' interest in founding a settlement in North Carolina and sold them nearly 100,000 acres of land in Piedmont, North Carolina in 1752 that the Moravians called Divahau or Wachovia after Zinzendorf's ancestral estate. The master plan for the North Carolina settlement included the eventual establishment of a central European, excuse me, a central industrial town or trade center in Wachovia. But first, the Moravian settlers arriving in 1753 were more concerned with survival. They founded their first Moravian settlement near an abandoned cabin and chose the name Bethabra, meaning House of Passage, and emphasizing their conviction <clears throat> that the first settlement was but a stepping stone to the founding of the central congregation town. Progress was slow in the backcountry, however, and the House of Passage actually remained the central town for nearly 20 years. It was not until 1765 that the need for the central town was brought to the forefront once again, and the site for that community was chosen. Construction of the town of Salem commenced in 1766. By April of 1772, much of the new town was completed, and 120 people moved from Bethabra to Salem, leaving behind a small farming community. For the next several decades, Salem functioned as a congregation town in which the church was central to all spiritual, secular, and economic activities. While the tightly controlled environment of the church governed Moravian communities certainly placed many restrictions on the residents, 
It also provided a safety net for craftsmen who might have found it difficult to make it on their own. The church regulated competition among those practicing the various trades and supported these craftsmen by promoting their goods outside the communities. The seemingly antithetical goals of protecting the faithful from outside influences while at the same time taking advantage of opportunities to benefit financially <clears throat> from trade with outsiders created a tension requiring the constant vigilance of church boards. A congressman traveling through North Carolina in the 1790s, William Lawton Smith, wrote the following comments about Salem. Quote, after traveling through the woods for many days, the sight of this little settlement of Moravians is highly curious and interesting. Between 200 and 300 persons of this sect here assembled live in brotherly love and set a laudable example of industry, unfortunately too little observed and followed in this part of the country. Every man follows some occupation. Every woman is engaged in some feminine work. From their labors, they supply not only themselves, but the country all around them. The first view of the town is romantic. As it breaks upon you through the woods, it is pleasantly seated on a rising ground and is surrounded by beautiful meadows, well-cultivated fields, and shady woods. The antique appearance of the houses built in the German style and trees among which they are placed have a singular and pleasing effect. On my arrival, I waited on a Mr. Baggy, one of the brethren, who keeps a store here. He very politely conducted me to the single men's house and to all the different trades. I found everyone hard at work. Such a scene of industry perhaps exists nowhere in so small a place. While visitors to the American Moravian communities often commented on the uniqueness of the towns, Moravian material culture cannot be compared to the material culture of other communal societies, such as the Shakers, in which religious beliefs dictated stylistic restraint. But as you can imagine, the arts of the Moravians do reflect their culture and their acculturation over time. The Moravian artisans who came to the American colonies in the 18th century came to America with a well-defined set of cultural images. The Moravian aesthetic incorporates a vocabulary of Central and Eastern European style, but it's really an amalgamation of influences that includes bits of English, French, and Scandinavian elements as well. Christians from across Europe were attracted to the Moravian settlements in Germany and elsewhere. The strong missionary intentions of the Moravians meant that from these European settlements, many followers were sent out to found and organize communities in the colonies and to missions around the world. A significant labor pool was developed within the network of European congregations in which masters and journeymen traveled from one Moravian town to another, inadvertently developing the Moravian aesthetic that continued to persist in America. Almost from the outset of their arrival in North Carolina, the residents of Bethabara began asking church leaders to send a potter. While early requests were met with encouragement by the church to substitute the use of wooden and metal vessels for pottery, the settlers' wishes were finally granted in 1755 when Master Potter Godfrey Doust, having trained under Andreas Stober in Herrenhut, made his way to Wachovia to set up a pottery shop. As you can imagine, pottery inventories from later in the 18th century indicate that the majority of what was on hand at any given time was utilitarian. Cream pots, jars, mugs, the objects of everyday use that were used up, broken, and discarded, and in regular need of replacement. By 1761, and probably earlier, word had spread that Bethabra was home to a potter in the backcountry. Customers traveled from as far as 50 and 60 miles away to buy pottery. Unfortunately, demand regularly far exceeded supply, exceeded supply and customers often left empty-handed. Disparities between demand and supply continued throughout the 18th century. A kiln opening in 1778, shortly after Oust moved the pottery operation from Bethabara to Salem, required the services of one Colonel Armstrong, quote, threatening the people with his drawn sword if they did not keep quiet, for there were not as many pieces of pottery in the shop as there were people outside. You're allowed to laugh. <laughs> It's like, did I get the right slide? 
Collections of extant Moravian earthenware objects are largely made up of the colorful, slip-decorated wares that were special and decorative then, just as they are to us today. They survive because they were well cared for, treasured objects. Most of the Moravian potters working in Wachovia can trace their training to Godfrey Doust, the first Moravian potter to arrive in North Carolina. Consequently, the stylistic and technical vocabulary of the slip decorated Wachovia tradition is quite well defined and tended to exhibit naturalistic motifs such as stylized flowers and plants rather than abstract geometrical figures. Although Aust worked <clears throat> primarily in a Central European tradition and taught his apprentices to do the same, the form of mugs and teapots from his shop reflect an understanding of prevailing English Rococo style, if not the exact <coughs> duplication of forms and materials. Now, any of the objects that have this sort of flat mustard color fill in are archaeological objects that were reconstructed. The darker pieces are the original pieces. And the only thing I can figure is that when these were done in 1972, um, you know, these, that mustard yellow was all the rage, and so they <laughs> chose to duplicate that. <laughs> Harvest gold was everywhere. In the 1770s, potters left jobless by the failure of John Bartlam's attempts to create, establish a creamware pottery in South Carolina, visited Salem, and offered Aust greater insight into the production of British earthenware forms. Whoops. <clears throat> these potters, one of whom was William Ellis, <laughs> probably had no trouble locating the shop of Aust, for not only did he have a guide in the person of Brother Baggy, the storekeeper, but just earlier the same year, Aust had created this shop sign in response to a proposal in 1773 by the church board that, quote, signs be placed on the houses of those having professions and on the store and the tavern for the convenience of strangers coming to town. The Cleveland <coughs> notes, the sign should give the name of the master and his profession, such as Godfrey Aust, a potter. Now, Godfrey Doust did put his name on this. He did not, however, put that he was a potter. And I'm thinking he was thinking it's a giant earthenware plate. If they can't figure out that I'm a potter, then, you know, they can go someplace else. <laughs> this piece serves as a veritable Rosetta Stone of the techniques and motifs used by Oust and is, without a doubt, one of the finest pieces of early American earthenware. At any rate, Oust requested permission of the Collegium to employ Ellis to teach him about the burning and glazing of Queensware and what was referred to in the records as tortoiseshell ware. One participant in the changes going on in the pottery was Aust's one-time apprentice, Rudolf Christ, who was probably working as a journeyman by the time Ellis made his appearance in Salem. The relationship between Christ and Aust was at best a mercurial one as the relationship between two highly spirited and creative people who regularly breathe lead dust is apt to be. Of course, the fact that Aust characterized um, Christ as, quote, a stupid ass to church leaders <laughs> could not have done none too much to nurture the relationship. But in all fairness to Aust, Christ was known for just not showing up and going hunting. He must have been a millennial <clears throat> because he, <laughs> he just wow. wouldn't show up for work. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. That was, that was actually a dig at an intern that I had recently, <laughs> not at anybody in this room. <laughs> Despite their troubled relationship, Christ actually eventually grew up, I suppose, because when Aust died in 1788, the church asked him to take over the mastership of the Salem pottery. So it was our friend Rudolf Christ who was visited by yet another traveling potter, Carl Eisenberg, in 1793. Eisenberg's visit started a series of experiments with tin glazed earthenware, which resulted in the production of yet another product line. The Wachovia potters were apparently well aware that introducing new forms and wares tended to bring in new customers, and that variety was the key to successful pottery operation. In fact, in a letter from Salem in 1793, the Salem administrator notes the addition of a new kiln for firing faience and comments, quote, Usually, each new line draws new customers, and there are potters enough around us where they would otherwise go. However, evidence above ground and below ground suggests that even as he experimented with new wares, Chris continued to make the more traditional products he had learned to produce under oust. The slip-decorated wares are a case in point. 
If we're to look at the body of extant slip decorated dishes, it's clear that the motifs chosen by Christ and his contemporaries are similar to those chosen by Oust, creating a unified body of work that changes only slightly over the first 50 or 60 years that the Moravian Potter's Shop was in operation. There's little evidence to support the use of anything but floral and, and naturalistic slip motifs on Moravian wares. The Moravians may have looked to published herbals or early German woodcuts for inspiration in creating the designs on their elaborately decorated wares. Flowers have long been used by artists and artisans as spiritual metaphors and symbols of the fleeting nature of life on earth. The Moravians certainly understood the significance of flower and plant metaphors. One has only to look at this church fractor to see that the Moravians understood and recognized the merit of symbolic art, especially in its power to illustrate religious truths and the power of God. In this image, the blood of Christ flows from his wounds and saturates the ground below a flourishing grapevine the leaves of which depict the many Moravian congregations around the world. Although this watercolor was painted in the 1770s, it's reflective of a period of radical thought and teaching in the Moravian church that started in the 1740s and emphasized the sacrifice of Christ for believers and the graphic contemplation of the wounds resulting from that sacrifice. Referred to <clears throat> as blood and wounds theology, these were the teachings that drew the most criticism by outsiders in the mid-18th century. I'll spare you some of the more bizarre images portrayed in church liturgies of the period. Probably in the interest of self-preservation, the Moravians themselves began to move away from the more fanatical aspects of blood and wounds theology by the 1750s. But the graphic vocabulary of the period and the focus on the iconography of Christ's sacrifice continued throughout the 18th and into the 19th century, especially in America. So it should come as no surprise that the Moravians chose to use Christian iconography on slip decorated dishes as communicators of this enduring faith. Take for example this extraordinary plate. This design is the only one that I know of that exists on more than one extant example. That in and of itself is significant. Variations of this design are common as well. Clearly the large petaled flowers are anemones and the central stalk represents Lily of the Valley as seen in these images from period botanical prints. Most of us in the 21st century look at these flowers and think, pretty flowers, nice composition. Um, <clears throat> but if you were Moravian living in the late 18th century in a church governed community in which you attended services daily, you had been brought up in a faith with Christ at the center and the contemplation of the very blood from the wounds he suffered for your redemption as central to your worldview, these flowers in particular meant something different to you. Christians have long believed anemones to be the flowers that sprung up from the ground beneath the crucified Christ as blood flowed from his wounds, as you see here in this 18th century watercolor from Herrenhut. Therefore, the anemone represents the sacrifice made by Christ for his followers. One of the most commonly cited flower metaphors in the Judeo-Christian tradition is Solomon 2.1. I am the rose of Sharon and lily of the valleys. Since the Middle Ages, the female voice in that verse has been interpreted as the bride in an allegory of the mystical marriage of each individual Christian to Christ. The Moravians have a long history of the detailed analysis of the proper course each believer should pursue in his or her personal relationship with Christ. Zinzendorf promoted the <clears throat> image of Christ as the bridegroom and each individual as Christ's bride. He frequently used the images in the Song of Solomon to advance the notion of this relationship, just as scholars preceding him and since have done. In the context of the Song of Solomon, the lily symbolizes the coming of Christ or the advent of Christ and each individual believer's relationship to him. The image on the plate, therefore, is symbolic on several levels. The fragile nature of ceramic represents the frailty of life, as do the flowers themselves. But the specific images chosen serve as a reminder of the centrality of the drama of salvation, as well as the importance of maintaining an intimate personal relationship with the Savior. <clears throat> 
We have only to look at the artwork of John Valentine Height to confirm our suspicions of this symbolism. Height's work of Cornelius contemplating his Christianity, which was owned in Wachovia, depicts a Roman centurion, Cornelius, who's considered to be the first Gentile to convert to Christianity. To Cornelius' right is Mary holding the Christ child. <clears throat> Just below the hem of Mary's robe are two white anemones with a stalk of lily buds between them, draped over a leather-bound book, presumably the New Testament. The floral composition is nearly identical to the arrangement of anemones to lilies on the slip decorated plates produced by Aust and his successors in Wachovia. In the context of the painting, the anemones represent the death of Christ yet to come rather than his actual crucifixion, so they are white rather than red. You might also notice that the Christ child <clears throat> is being held by his mother and is holding a rose. I'm sure that I don't have to remind you, and certainly no one had to remind the Salem potters, of the significance of the rose as a Christian symbol of purity and perfection, or as in the Song of Songs, the Rose of Sharon, a symbol of that mystical union between Christ and his church. Incidentally, it was not began until, and we, we also see um, roses depicted on some of these dishes as well. It was not until I started thinking about the symbolism of these flowers that I took another look at von Redeken's view of Salem, um, painted in 1787. And <clears throat> a similar version of this was painted and sent to Herrenhut, sort of as an example of the growth of the community and how well um, it had done. And it became clear to me that the watercolor depicts Salem as situated on a ridge, um, adding the flourishing roses and grapevines in front. Um, and there's no question that the leaders of Salem were depicting their community and presenting it as a city on a hill, the thriving, a thriving branch of the true vine, um, <clears throat> and with the, you know, the roses added as well, one of, of purity and, and religious significance. In view of the Moravians' constant battle to balance their need for trade with outsiders or strangers, as they call visitors to the community, with their desire to insulate themselves from the outside world, the slip decorated dishes and other graphic depictions of important Christian symbols may well have been intended, at least in part, um, <clears throat> as avenues for reminding the faithful of the teachings of the blood and wounds theology without inciting condemnation of those who did not understand it. It's really through an understanding of the spiritual history of the Moravians that we can discern the complicated meanings of this art in clay. And it's only in the context of the Moravians' impassioned beliefs that we can fully understand the significance of these images to those people at that time. It's not new to introduce new things to get customers coming back. And we've already talked about how Oust and Chris both um, introduced new products to the pottery fairly regularly. <clears throat> At the turn of the 19th century, Rudolf Christ, the second master potter, um, began to introduce these figural bottles. A comparison of the squirrel bottle on the left with the English pearlware example on the right leaves little doubt as to what inspired Christ to make this particular figure. Fish bottles were some of the most popular of the figural bottles, and the one at the top of the screen has a history of having been given to a child in 1804 as a gift. People have called these bottles um, flasks, and they're, they were not flasks. They're not glazed on the inside, so they could not have been used to hold liquid. Not to mention the fact that I don't know about a squirrel in your pocket. I'm not sure that would be terribly comfortable. They really were intended as collectibles then, just as they are today. Some of the bottles did have specific purposes. The, some of the chickens have holes um, suggesting their uses as casters. And others, as I said, were just collectible then, just as they are today. In fact, we can think of Chris as introduce, introducing the impulse buy to Salem. You know, you come with your, you come to get the earthenware that you need, and you leave with the earthenware you didn't know you needed. <clears throat> Eventually, press molded figurable offerings included turkeys, duck terrines, and even Indians. I have no idea what an Indian bottle looks like. I would love to know what that means exactly. So, if you ever see one, call me first. Um, it was during the height of the popularity 
of press molded wares that we begin to see American, American iconography infiltrate um, Moravian decorative arts, most likely based on mold-blown glass eagle bottles of the same period, this piece serves as the best evidence yet of the ongoing acculturation of the Moravians who clearly, by 1819, began incorporating American symbols into their arts. Interestingly, 1819 was the same year that John Vogler built his brick house on the corner of Main and Bank Streets, complete with an eagle door knocker. Although we won't spend a lot of time on Salem silver, I do want to mention the work of Salem's, one of Salem's early silversmiths, John Vogler. He was trained as a gunsmith, <clears throat> but he began making trips to Pennsylvania in the early 19th century, probably to work with Bethlehem silversmith and clockmaker Samuel Krause. In fact, the dye that Vogler used to emboss the bowls of his spoons with his trademark eagle um, mark what you see here is similar to the one used by Krauss at about the same time. Vogler's product line apparently included various spoons, teaspoons, tablespoons, ladles, things like that, and other flatware. Evidence that he made hollowware is very limited, although we do know of this and one other um, little tobacco box that came from um, his shop. He did make precision instruments as well, such as this compass, surveyor's compass, and he operated a successful business repairing clocks and watches. In 1819, he married the single sister, Christina Spock, <clears throat> whom you see here, in portraits painted by Salem's first native landscape and portrait painter, Daniel Welfare, about 1830. Now we're gonna shift gears again and talk a little bit about needlework. As a child, Christina had been one of the first little girls to attend the Salem Girls School once it moved from its quarters in the single sister's house to the building erected specifically for the school in 1805. The school was founded in 1772 for the education of a few little Moravian girls, and by 1804 had grown to include both town girls, as the Moravian girls were called, as well as non-Moravian boarding students. The most distinctive objects surviving from the Salem Girls Boarding School are the needleworks created by the students. This sampler, made by Christina Spock, is small compared to other Salem samplers. It's only about 10 inches high. Christina used several of the motifs that commonly appear on Salem samplers and have come to be associated with the Moravian sampler tradition, such as the wreath, the plinth, and the well. Not surprisingly, the samplers made by the students at the Moravian girls' schools resemble German examples made from the same period in basic layout and motif um, selection and organization. Near the center, Christina has stitched a floral wreath. On the lower left, she stitched a plinth draped in a garland and adorned with her parents' initials and the date 1804, presumably the date she finished the sampler. The plinth is also a common motif seen on a variety of more ornate Moravian needleworks and speaks to the infiltration of neoclassical style into the Moravian aesthetic <clears throat> at the beginning of the 19th century. It's a symbol we will see again on morning embroideries and it appears on this watercolor that was painted by Ludwig von Redeken for the first inspector of the girls' school, Samuel Crompsch. And this is in the Moravian Archives collection and I would really like to see it in person sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Just throwing that out there. <laughs> the roses comprising von Redeken's watercolor wreath and those of the wreath Christina worked in silk on linen are no doubt intended as symbols of the victory of Christ, just as they were to the maker of this 17th century German woodcut. The well motif is perhaps <clears throat> the most overtly religious symbol that the little girls at the Salem School incorporated into their samplers, and is incidentally or not, the largest and most prominent on Christina's sampler. The object of the well and its product, water, figure heavily into biblical teachings with which Christina, as a Moravian from birth, would have been well-schooled. Of course, we're all familiar with the story from the Gospel of John of Christ preaching the gospel to the Samaritan woman at the well who then left her water pot, in other words, dropped everything, 
to go spread the gospel among the townspeople. <coughs> it's tempting to speculate that this symbol and this story had special significance to the female teachers at the school whose mission was to teach impressionable young women and girls the Moravian doctrine of salvation. The story of the woman at the well is one of Christian witness by a woman the very thing the young teachers were called to do through their teaching. This is not to suggest that they were burning their bras on the square or anything like that, <laughs> but I do think that, that, it, that it's an interesting association. For an added fee, little girls attending Salem um, could add ornamental needlework to their curriculum. These works took three forms, morning embroideries, pictorial embroideries, and commemorative em embroideries. Though the Moravians believed in equality in death, as is dramatically illustrated in the plain flat stones of God's Acre just out the window, um, <clears throat> in their needlework at, at least, they quickly adopted the neoclassical symbols of grief so, so prevalent, particularly after the death of George Washington. The weeping woman and other symbols of mourning, including a tomb, cypress trees on some, willows on others, and a draped urn. This example, with silk thread, chenille, and ribbon on silk, was completed by Minerva Hurd in 1822 and includes an ink inscription lamenting her father's passing. The watercolor portions of the mourners' faces may have been painted in works such as this one by the child's teachers. The students at, their, at the Salem Girls Boarding School often use their talents with the needle to express their appreciation to their teachers and others who influence them. It's interesting to note the application of typical mourning motifs transformed into symbols to honor the living. The plinth surrounded by cypress trees in the case on the left inscribed gratitude by some students wishing to thank a teacher, and the broken or shortened um, column encircled with a rose garland with love, esteem, and gratitude on the right, stitched by students for Inspector Samuel Cromsch in 1806. Okay, I know some people like furniture, so you can wake up now. This column, this column was broken on purpose, right? Mm -hmm. the, the broken column was a symbol of a life cut short. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'll tell you a funny, not a funny story, but interesting story about that. <clears throat> it's sort of foretold, Samuel Cromsch actually got into some trouble. He was the first inspector of the Salem Girls School, and he was let go, encouraged to leave, and we don't really know why, but there was some um, there was some scandal involved. <clears throat> we don't. I mean, you know, he might have said a bad word for all we know. <laughs> but I've always thought it was interesting that this piece that they um, made for him has that shortened column. It sort of foretold his his downfall. Um, uh, anyway, okay. In contrast to German American settlers, such as those responsible. Um, for the lively shrunk on the right, Moravians did not seem to use the surfaces of furniture as canvas for, canvases for metaphorical theological images. The 18th century Moravian aesthetic in furniture is one of bold proportions that relies heavily on the vocabulary of the Baroque period, well beyond the time that those elements were considered the height of style. The retention of Baroque design and construction is indicative of the training of these artisans in the first half of the 18th century. The 18th century cabinet makers working in Wachovia were transplanted here from Europe with little of what we might call an American filter. When Moravian furniture styles do change, the, upda the updates are more closely tied to a new influx of cabinet makers from Europe rather than the evolution of style within a prevailing shop. An excellent example of the Moravians' use of Baroque design and construction is this walnut stretcher table, which with its turned legs, stretcher base, and ebonized ball feet, belies its construction date of 1775. It looks like it could have been made much earlier. The top is held in place with pinned sliding dovetailed battens, a feature used to prevent the warping of tabletops in the Baroque period that the Moravians continued to use well into the 19th century. The dramatic OG cornice of this cherry and cherry veneer desk and bookcase made about 1795 for the potter Rudolf Christ might tempt you to suggest an earlier date for this tour de force from the shop of the master joiner Johannes Krauss, who spent 20 years as the style setter of Moravian furniture in North Carolina. <clears throat> 
a recently discovered um, but undated cabinet maker's price list from Salem suggests a price of four pounds 18 shillings for a bookcase arched and 10 pounds 16 shillings for a polished desk. This desk might actually have caught a little, cost a little bit more than those suggested prices because it's a rare example of um, inlaid veneered American Moravian furniture. And I think it's kind of fun that the desk and bookcase that belong to the potter who used slip decoration on the dishes <laughs> is the one that we know of that has inlay and veneer. But anyway, I digress. The earliest surviving chair form from the Wachovia communities is one that combines a solidly Baroque back complete with a curved crest rail and vasiform splat. The 1766 inventory of the Gemeinde House, a community building with a chapel and housing for the pastor, lists, quote, six black walnut chairs with woven seats, probably referring to chairs like this one. The arm supports of this upholstered Moravian chair made in the Bethlehem community are similar to the splat of the side chair, emphasizing the close relationship between the arts of the communities in Pennsylvania and North Carolina. Frequent travel between the two regions and the movement of settlers back and forth ensured some continuity of style among the communities. The 18th century price list also lists <clears throat> Um, the making of wooden components of an armchair, indicating that the wood and work would cost one pound four shillings. Indeed, at least in Salem, records suggest that upholstery work, leather upholstery work, um, would have been the job of the local saddler and harness maker. The turn of the 19th century saw a new group of four cabinet makers make its way from Europe to North Carolina over the course of five years. Although all of these masters came to America from Moravian communities in Germany, one was from Sweden, one from Denmark, and one from Switzerland. They brought with them a Teutonic interpretation of neoclassical style in which broad proportions are maintained, but lines are simplified. It's also about this time that we begin to see upholstered furniture um, <clears throat> appearing on inventories of Moravian households and church buildings. Usually adorned with cushions, such as this example, surviving settees closely resemble pieces illustrated in Scandinavian interior views, such as these two Copenhagen, actually such as this one Copenhagen <laughs> interior, a subtle reminder of the multinational nature of German-speaking Moravians in North Carolina. As we've seen, in the 18th and 19th century, American Moravian communities were populated by craftsmen with a variety of European backgrounds. <clears throat> what unified them was their commitment to the Moravian ideal. Painters on canvas and clay used their talents to create illustrations that expressed the theology of church members, either overtly or discreetly, in the 18th and beginning of the 19th centuries. Single sisters incorporated other spiritual metaphors as they taught students in the girls' school various needlework techniques. The work of cabinet makers is perhaps less an expression of theology than it is a manifestation of the retention of familiar styles. Although Moravian church communities sought a certain isolation from the outside world, church members recognized the economic potential of pursuing commercial interaction with members of surrounding neighborhoods. To this end, the Moravians in the North Carolina communities produced furniture, pottery, silver, textiles, and a myriad of other materials for sale, not only to members of their own communities, but also to customers from the surrounding region. As unique as the early Moravian settlements in America were, in many ways, the story of Moravians settling in and adapting to the Atlantic world in the 18th and 19th centuries is the quintessential American story. Yes, some of the philosophical and religious teachings of the church stressed protection of the faithful through isolation. Yet at the same time, the Moravians in America were trying to isolate themselves from strangers, as they called them. Theirs is the story of adaptation and acculturation as what made them unique, mingled with forces of change in the young republic. Ultimately, by the second quarter of the 19th century, the Moravian story is one of assimilation. The emphasis in this circa 1825 painting of Salem by Salem artist Daniel Welfare is the mill in the foreground, industrial success, not the spiritual success emphasized by von Redeken in his view of the town 50 years earlier. <clears throat> 
The miniatures painted by Elias Vogler, the son of John Vogler, in the mid-18th century depict Americans who look just like their neighbors, unlike the height portraits of decades earlier, which included religious imagery and emphasized intentional differences in clothing that set Moravians apart, such as the halba tied with a different colored ribbon for each stage of a girl and later a woman's white, uh, life. And some of the furniture of the shop of Karsten Peterson becomes by the 1830s not all that different from the furniture being made in other small towns throughout America, including apparently Great Falls, New Hampshire, where Mr. and Mrs. Daniel Otis are pictured here with their child in a watercolor by Joseph Davis with a table very similar to the one made by Peterson. John Ruskin once wrote that great nations write their autobiographies in three manuscripts, the book of their deeds, the book of their words, and the book of their arts. Not one of these books can be understood unless we read the two others. But of the three, the only trustworthy one is the last. And indeed, it's through the arts of the Moravians that we begin to see their uniqueness and can catch a glimpse of their impact on the American experience. The end. <laughs>